Gospel of our Savior, Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I want to begin here. Solemnly, Mary entered the room, holding high the alabaster jar. It gleamed in the lamplight as she circled the room, incensing the disciples, blessing Martha's banquet. A splendid table, Mary called with her eyes as she whirled past her sister. She came to a halt at last before Jesus, bowed profoundly and knelt at his feet. Deftly, she filled her right hand with nard placed the jar on the floor, took one foot in her hands, and moved fragrant fingers across his instep. Over and over, she made the journey from heel to toes, thanking him for every step he had made on Judea's stony hills, for every stop at their home for bringing back Lazarus. She poured out more nard, took his other foot in her hands, and started again with strong rhythmic strokes. She felt her hands heat, draw out his tiredness, take away the rebuffs he had known, the shut doors, the shut hearts. Energy flowed like a river between them. His saturated skin gleamed with oil. She had no towel. In an instant, she pulled off her veil, pulled the pins from her hair, shook it out till it fell in cascades, and once more cradled each foot, dried the ankles, the insteps, drew the strands between his toes. Without warning, Judas Iscariot spat out his anger, the words hissing like lightning above her unveiled head. Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? Leave her alone, Jesus silenced the usurper. She bought it so that she might keep it 
for the day of my burial. The words poured like oil, anointing her from head to foot. I begin with this poem written by Irene Zimmerman in 2007 because it slows us down and invites us to really hear what just before we have heard proclaimed in the 12th chapter of John's Gospel. Because when we hear the Gospels year after year, Sunday after Sunday over our lives, if we're not careful, if we're not extraordinarily attentive, they become like audio wallpaper where we simply say, oh, I know that story. Irene Zimmerman's poem helps us to really be there, to really see, to really smell, to really feel the power of that gathering. It is within a week as they gather of Jesus' betrayal, his trial, his condemnation, his suffering, and his death on the cross. It is just after Jesus has raised Martha and Mary's brother Lazarus from the dead. Four days he lay in the tomb, and on that fourth day he heard a familiar voice speak with authority three words, Lazarus, come out. At table in the home of Lazarus and Mary and Martha this night, in their familiar dining room around a table that they and Jesus know well, nothing is ordinary. In that room is life and death. In that room is a man living who was dead, dead and rotting. In that room is a man who is apparently alive, but who knows that he is about to die a violent death. That room, set here on the earth in the village of Bethany, just outside the city of Jerusalem, that room is the abiding place of both life and death. And brothers and sisters, wherever we are, that is always true. I wrote earlier this week that we think of ourselves here as situated at the corner of Southbridge and Cambridge. It is more realistic to say that we are situated, all of us, always, all the time, at the intersection of life and death. Just this morning, I came across a journalist reflecting upon an interview he had done that day with a woman who had come to know that she had a disease that was going to take her life, and he asked her, what is it like to know that you are going to die? And she responded to him, what is it like to pretend that you're not? Jesus' disciples, as we know from the, from the Gospels, those who are with him along the road every day, heard him say three times, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to, betray to the, be betrayed to the authorities. I'm going to be tried. I'm going to be convicted. I'm going to be tortured. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. And on the third day, I'm going to rise again. He said it once, twice, three times that we know of. And they said, huh? Mary of Bethany, unlike all of them, knew. Somehow, she knew. And so in the midst of this meal, in a familiar place, in the presence of life and death, Mary makes obvious how extraordinary that moment is. She takes a pound of aromatic nard. 
She opens it. She bends down before him on the floor. And she begins to anoint his feet with that perfume and dries it with her hair. If you were at a meal anywhere, if you were in a restaurant with 300 tables, and at one of the tables that started to happen, I guarantee you that moment by moment, second by second, all other activity, every other sound in that space would cease. What she does, as Judas recognizes, unfortunately, what she does is absolutely extravagant. It is, as the British would say, over the top. It is, we could say, ridiculous. If you wanted to anoint a friend's feet with aromatic nard, you would need two handfuls. You wouldn't need a pound. But somehow Mary knows who this is. She knows that this man she has come to know and love is in himself the most direct revelation of who God is and how God is that she or anyone else has ever seen or can ever see on the face of the earth. And she knows with his death nearing she has to do something to make that, to express that, to make it real in sight and sound and smell. And we're told by people who know what aromatic nard is like, that this close in time to his trial and crucifixion, it is quite likely that when he was raised up on the cross on Calvary, when he hung there between heaven and earth, that the centurion at the foot of the cross would have picked up in the air there and then the scent of that perfume that Mary used that night. Judas objects, and in almost any other circumstance, his objection would sound like he is speaking prophetically on, belief, on behalf of the poor. What are we doing here? This stuff is valuable. It's worth a year's salary. Why wasn't it sold and the money used to help the poor? But this was no ordinary moment. And to broaden that out a bit, let me suggest to you that you and I in our lifetimes have never known an ordinary moment. And that if your parents could be here and your grandparents and their parents and you began to talk to them about their experience in life, about the wars they knew, about the new inventions, about the difficulties at home, about looking for work and losing work, they would be able to tell you that as far back as you can see in the generations of your family and mine and everyone who has ever lived, there never has been an ordinary moment. Which means that in relationship to Christ, in relationship to God, our expressions, like Mary's, of our faith should not be neat and clean and quiet. They should be extravagant. They should be over the top. They should be ridiculous. One of the professors I had in seminary teaching us about the sacraments said, you know that little kind of at baptism we use sometimes, that little kind of, it looks like a shell, but it's made of metal, and it holds that little teensy bit of water, and you take the teensy bit of water and you put the teensy bit of water. This prof said, what in the name of God are you doing? Picture instead the people who go down into the Jordan River and say, here's the head of the person to be baptized. I baptize you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to use the water, 
Use it extravagantly. If you're going to anoint someone at confirmation or later in baptism on the head, we take, we take the oil, we take it out of the bottle so it doesn't get wasted, we put it in cotton. And the priest gets a little bit of a hint of the oil on his or her finger and anoints the forehead. This prof said to us, take the bottle, open the bottle, and pour it over their head. If you're going to anoint them for the love of God, anoint them. Make it unforgettable. Make it obvious that that moment, this moment, every moment, never is an ordinary moment, ever, anywhere. Why? Because the God who was working in Jesus Christ is always at work and is never doing anything that is less than revelatory of absolute abundance. Look at our readings today from Isaiah that Millie shared with us. First, the prophet says to people in exile who thought they had no hope, the prophet says, remember what God did for our forebears coming out of Egypt. How did we get out of Egypt? We didn't expect to get out of Egypt. We expect to be slaves forever. We were slaves for 400 years. God brought them out, separated the Red Sea so they could get through and walked with them all the way into the promised land. He reminds them of this marvelous exodus moment in their memory and then says this immediately afterwards, do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. This certainly means that Isaiah was not an Episcopalian, even though there were none at the time. What does he say in there? He says, we're like, oh, this is the way we do things. This is sacred. This has to be. God says through his own prophet, appreciate what has been done in the past, and then let it be the past. Because God says, and you chose this next quote on your parish profile when you were looking for a new rector. You said, you quoted God saying through the prophet, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? That moment of godly speech is not just then, it is forever. Paul, in his epistle to the Philippians today, writing from prison. So we have people in exile without hope. We have Paul in prison writing to his friends at Philippi, talking about his own life, how he started life as a faithful Hebrew, how he was zealous for the law, how he was a Pharisee, and then he says that something new happened. He was freed from things he didn't think he needed to be freed from. He says, for the sake of Christ, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish. Our translations are also always neat and clean. The word that you hear there is rubbish, in the original Greek that Paul wrote, is not rubbish. It is a word that begins with the word, the letters S and H, and ends with the letter T. That's what he says. I consider everything that I thought of value, I held as value before, as... Sorry, the audio is still on, folks. I just couldn't say that out loud. Why, though? He says, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And this newness that God has brought about, not asked for by Paul. Did Paul ask, by the way, he wasn't on a horse outside Damascus, he was walking. But did Paul ask to be, to be knocked down and blinded by a bright light and to meet Jesus Christ in that way? No. It was God's determination. But Paul made it his own and says, I do not consider that I've made all this my own, but this one thing I do, 
Here it is again. Does this sound like Isaiah? Forgetting what lies behind. Paul says, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. The goal is living always in the company of Jesus Christ. What does God do? God saves. What does God do? God renews. What does God do? God rescues. Even when we don't know there's anything to be rescued from. I may have told you before, all my growing up years, very close to Lynn Beach, east of here, on the big wall that jutted out near Red Rock, every year at this time of year, somebody would take the time one night in beautiful script to write it across that wall, Jesus is the answer. Every year within the next two weeks, someone else came and crossed it out as best they could and wrote next to it, what is the question? <laughs> what I'm telling you this morning is, you don't have to know what the question is. You don't have to be calling out for salvation. You don't have to be calling out for rescue. It's coming your way Anyway, we tend to think always in terms not of, a, of God's abundance, but supposedly of our lack. Oh, I don't have enough energy. Oh, I don't have enough time. Oh, I don't have enough money. Oh, I don't have enough relatives who are smart enough to know I'm the smartest one of them, right? I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have the other thing. In the midst of it all, if we could just stop complaining for a nanosecond, if not verbally, at least in here, God comes in Jesus, as he will in just moments here at this table, reclines with us at table, and invites us into ever deeper relationship with him, and through him, into relationship with the one who sent him. One more thing. At the very end of the gospel, Jesus says in answer to the objection of Judas, leave her alone. <clears throat> she bought that oil so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you but you do not always have me. That implies, referring back to the 15th chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, Moses' last sermon to his people before, without him, they entered into the Holy Land. It implies that if I or you want to make an extravagant gift to Jesus, as Mary did, out of a sense of experiencing God's abundance in our lives, as I hope we have and I hope we will, then the fastest route to make that kind of extravagant gift to Jesus is to find the ones that Mother Teresa of Calcutta called the poorest of the poor and make that kind of extravagant gift to them.